So I have a question. Do you remember your first passion? That thing that you cared so deeply about, you were willing to risk shame to, to give that to somebody else. So I thought I would start out with a, my first passion, which was music. And of course, in a lot of times when you're 13 years old, there's a girl involved. This happened to be my, um, my best friend's 18-year-old sister. Remember, we're 13, she's 18, and she turned us on to Alice Cooper. Anybody else like Alice? Love Alice? Yeah, he's, a, he's, he's great. And, there, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of why, but he really inspired me at 13. Granted, it was also inspiring to have an 18-year-old, what I thought, woman show you Alice Cooper, tell you about it. So I got my first month's allowance right after that, and I bought my first two Alice Cooper albums, including Killer. And um, I decided to do something really stupid. I decided to make a, um, a mixtape. Anybody do mixtapes? Yeah, yeah. So I, I call these things burp mo moments. You know, when you burp, you can't take it back. And so that was kind of what happened here because I decided to profess my love with this mixtape in front of my best friend and in front of her girlfriends. And needless to say, this is what it looked like with, with Peggy, this 18-year-old that I tried to have a a mixtape romance with. But, um, so why Alice Cooper? And, and this goes in as I thought about coming here to talk with you guys. Um, it's really interesting. I think bands are phenomenal in how they're able to stand the test of time. When Alice Cooper came out, some people thought he was demonic or Satan. No, not at all. He really was blending horror, humor, and vaudeville entertainment, but what he considered himself was a rock and roll Captain Hook, which I thought was pretty cool, and oddly enough, I got that, and then when I started reading about him, I was like, no, nope, no shit, I thought he was Captain Hook with his makeup. So the interesting thing about Alice is he inspired me to go for it, and that was to start out on a career for art in advertising and design because he was an artist that was doing theatrics before anyone. Kiss, some even David Bowie, um, Marilyn Manson, those guys all own, owe everything to Alice Cooper. So think about it. Alice's first hit, Be My Lover, was in 1972. How many brands are still relevant today? How many bands can own a cult status with their fans like a band can. So anyone heard of a band called Sister Hazel? No, it's, a, it's a, a southern band. They're from Gainesville, Florida. The interesting thing about Sister Hazel, and I was hoping no one had heard of them, but maybe you should Google them and listen to their music, it's awesome. They had one Billboard Top 100 hit, and that was in 1997. But now, almost two decades later, they have fans called Hazelnuts. <laughs> Hazelnuts actually go on the forums, the band gives them free tickets to give to people that they call virgins, and they embrace them. And so when they, when they go to do a sound check, their fans line up, the Hazelnuts do, they go buy pizza, they eat with them in line as they're waiting to get into the concert. These guys are amazing, they're relevant, they do cruise ship concerts, they have philanthropic things with their fans. And in my opinion, bands know the secret sauce of being cultish. And Ken Block says, no fans, no band. And that's something that we have to remember. They do, because that's their very existence. They have to have people buy their music, come to their shows. And we can tell when they're authentic, when they care about us. So I want to say officially hello. And um, I, I've changed my title. It was Word of Mouth Inspiration Officer Robin, who's president of Brains on Fire, is here. I'm going to call myself Passion Pirate from now on. Kind of being inspired from Alice Cooper. But I have the honor of, of working at Brains on Fire to where we go out and we participate in people's lives. We have to be very empathetic. The people that come to us, the for-profits and the not-for-profits, are fighting some form of injustice. And so we work under the black flag of Brains on Fire. We consider ourselves a pirate ship. We fly this off of our building 
in downtown Greenville, South Carolina, and it pisses the city off, but we don't care. We do it when we've got something to celebrate. So I will kind of get going here by saying that, that I challenge you guys, all of you in, the, in these rooms, because you have, in this room, because you have that cult status or you're trying to achieve that cult status. And if you don't have loud and proud, passionate fans, and I will say those that give a shit about what you do more than you do, there's no chance that you'll be a cult brand. And that's the challenge today. They almost have to care about you and value what you do more than you do. So I have a confession. Um, I'm a social media agnostic, and I hope you are too, because we've got a problem. We're smitten with the shiny objects. Hell, I am. I've got an iPhone 6 Plus up here, I uh, tweet, I Instagram, but this becomes the first place we start when we start looking at strategy, instead of starting with people first. And that's another challenge, is we've got to do that instead of the tactics and the tools. Inst and we also have to stop playing follow the leader and take a person's best practice and make it our next practice because that's not going to be authentic for you in the relationship with your advocates. So we've got a problem. We really exist in this bubble of check the box marketing. I've got to get on Pinterest, check. I've got a Facebook, check. I've got to tweet fast and furiously, check. I call this the what the F syndrome. I know what y'all think, but I really mean WordPress, Twitter, and Facebook, because I'm Southern, and I'm not going to say the real one, but anyway. Today, we don't decide what gets talked about. People do. Our customers do. We no longer control the channel. I know that is not news to you guys, but I can tell you we still have clients that come to us every day that still believe they own the channel. The interesting thing here, and this is from word of mouth research nerds Keller Fay, advertising only prompts 22% of all conversations people have about your stuff or about your organization. That means 78% there's a huge playground of other. And that involves a lot of word of mouth conversation on your behalf. People that are leaving messengers out there for your brand or your organization. So what are you doing about it? How are you creating touch points that are in their life that affect this? The best word of mouth marketing that you can do is not a tweet or a viral video. The best word of mouth is how you do business every single day. It's how you open the door. It's the sign that you have out front. It's insane to think, okay, you go and buy a $3.99 sign and, and think about what it, how that affects you when you see a sign like that compared to one that's handwritten, that's on chalk. It starts to give you a different touch point that they value you. There's something interesting going on there. But we sometimes fail just from how we open up our business every day. So I believe, as marketers, that we have a love language problem. But the love language problem that I want to get nerdy with you guys a little bit about is understanding why people talk and share about your brand and your organization. And believe it or not, there's now some science that tells us how to do that. So I want to get nerdy with you. I'm a, I'm a word of mouth research nerd. And I want to use a, a centerpiece of a, of a paper to create what we call WAMology, which is word of mouth marketing, ology, whatever, something like that. The centerpiece is a paper written in 2011. It was just updated in 2013, own brands and word of mouth. And what they tell us is that there's three motivational triggers that spark us to talk and share on behalf of a brand. They're functional, they're social, and they're emotional. And it's really not rocket science. The functional conversation is the nuts and bolts stuff we have every day. It's me telling you that I drive a Mini Cooper, I was in a, a bad wreck four years ago, it saved my life because it's got eight airbags, it's built really well. That's a functional conversation. So we engage in these conversations to help us understand and interpret the world. It helps us know how to use something, when to use it, and where to use it. We have these conversations all the time. A more involved trigger is the social trigger. And this one's really, really interesting. Um, 
This is how we show our uniqueness, our expertise, and how smart we are. Think about all the things that we signal every day, whether it's the Tim Horton Cup, it's Starbucks, Patagonia, BMW, Mini Cooper, Moleskin, Tom Shoes, Coach, Louis Vuitton, whatever it is that you, it might be Selvage Denim for us guys, there's a ton of guys wearing those here. Those are social signals. They say something unique about us. And the scientists call this that. They call it social signaling. And that's something to think about. How does your brand, how do the symbols and artifacts go into people's lives and they carry it forward for you? Do they want to own it? Is it designed for them to own it? So people engage in social conversations, again, to impress people, show how unique we are and how smart we are. And I did say I was social media agnostic, but I social the shit out of stuff. I apologize. I'm a, you know, it's my camera, it's my car, it's spin class, it's bourbon, it's coffee, it's my dog, soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, um, American boots, and American football. Uh, and so we do that. We think of all the things you Instagram, you update on your Facebook. Maybe this is your, whatever you're doing with Vine, whatever that may be. Those are social signals we put out there. The last one is emotional. These are the things that make us laugh, make us cry, make us happy, make us angry. This is a big trigger. Think about that. So when a brand creates a strong emotion, and a really strong emotion, they're more likely to be talked about. When we're happy, we're overjoyed, we tell people. When we're disgusted and we hate something, we tell people. And think about it. If it's just okay, if it's just customer service, we don't tell anybody. It has to be remarkable today to earn a share of our voice and be motivated to share. Today, the challenge is that brands are talked about in two different channels. We know this, but did you know that we talk about it differently? The online channel and the offline channel are very different because the offline channel is real personal. It's face-to-face. -face. It's people that we know. It's people that we're close to. And so we're more prone to talk about things that are personal. The offline channel, I mean the online channel, is now public. Think of Facebook and Twitter. It is a public channel. So people can see all the stuff. I'm sure if you have kids and they post something, you go, God, I wish they wouldn't have posted that. It's because it's a public channel. So these two channels are very different. So the offline motivation that leads is emotional. That would be like if Chris and I went to lunch and we sat down and he asked me a question and I said, hang on, give me about an hour to answer that. He would never want to go to lunch with me again. These, these offline conversations are continuous conversations. We have to interact like a human being. But online, it's discontinuous. Think about it. When you get somebody that sends you an email or a text, if you're smart, sometimes you wait a while before you answer it. And sometimes we don't. So social is best for online. So I want to share with you guys what I can And sorry, it's dry here. I'm used to humidity. That's crazy. I want to share with you guys the... Um, poster child from Wamology, and that is the humble chicken sandwich. Does anybody know what this is? Didn't think so. You do. I showed this in Australia. They were like, this is the most disgusting sandwich I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you mean somebody eats chicken and a bun and two pickles? Uh, yes, they do. And, um, and so how does a functional sandwich like this, a brand like this, earn an average year selling 280 million sandwiches. They kick Kentucky Fried Chicken's butt with less stores. How do they do that? Well, the brand I'm talking about is Chick-fil-A. Has anybody heard of Chick-fil-A? Anybody had, had one? They're like crack. It's like Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> it really, really is. Yeah. So this sandwich, this sandwich and, this, and this organization is really, really interesting uh, because how does somebody that sells waffle fries earn this type of social 
play out by people. Because if you Google moo, Chick-fil-A, cow, you're going to find tons and tons of images of waffle fries. And I don't know why. Maybe she's showing off her, her, her um, manicure. I don't know. Why would you take a picture like that? Um, styrofoam cups at the beach or my cup in, at the beach. What's interesting, see these hashtags? They don't sell beef. They only sell chicken. And part of this goes to their marketing strategy, is that they have a schema breaker. Their advertising is done by cows. And the reason they do that is, is and maybe this is American, but they're smart and they know that humans are, will fall for anything, especially when it comes to dressing up like a cow to get a free sandwich, which is what they do. I mean, this is pretty typical. So you do this on the day that they do this, like the cow day, and you get a free sandwich. People will also camp out when they open a new store. They give away Chick-fil-A's for life. Sometimes a week out, people are cam camping out to get to this thing. So this is an amazing brand. But here's their emotional story. Dan Cathy, the CEO several years ago, made a comment about the downfall of America related to um, gay and lesbian rights and marriage. And it signaled a firestorm. Remember that word of mouth thing about emotional, what stimulates that supercharged emotion? Well, that's what this did. On one hand, it, it kicked off and stimulated the, the, a world record for the most sandwiches sold in a day after he did that. And the interesting thing here in Atlanta is how it brought this emotion out God bless Dan Cathy. Right next to her, God hates Chick-fil-A. And so the interesting thing here is, is that today, your brand, your organization is a lens. And people want to know what's behind your brand. Do you have a crazy Uncle Larry? What did you do here? What did you do there? And yet those principles are what people are going to love you for. And with that, some are going to hate you. But that's the way that we live today and with social media and where people own their own channel and they have their own voice. So the wise Master Yoda once said, you must unlearn what you have learned. And I think as marketing, we have to do that. Because I really believe that the marketing business is the people business. It's people who buy your products. It's people who make an unknown brand known is people that turn a cause into a crusade. So if we're in the people business, I think we're in the love business. I don't think we're, sorry, Facebook, the like business. I think that's what we're in. And with that, passion is that vital element that you have to get to and you have to find. Passion is like destiny. In my opinion, it's like peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's destiny. But passion... It's really interesting. Uh, we were doing research for a client, and we were in, I was in Texas, and this gentleman was telling about his passion for uh, owning a gym. And he said, passion is not something you own. Passion is something you pass on to someone else, unless you're a really selfish person. But that's something we need to think about. The heart of passion is caring for something, loving, loving it so much that you think it's going to be so valuable to somebody else, you're going to pass it on. So think about it. Our job as marketers is to connect people through shared passions. So if we do that, we need to think about our, what we do as our job a little bit differently. We're storytellers. We're matchmakers. We're marketing cupids. If we think as mar of, of marketing as matchmaking, it's going to change the way you think. You're going to start with people first instead of tools and tactics. So I've got a couple of love stories to share for you, and I'm doing good. Okay, let's see if I can finish in time. So I have a question, another question. How many of you are passionate about your town you're from? Raise your hand. I know you are. Yeah, okay, you are. Where do you live? Up Calgary? Okay. So how many of you are thinking about coming to Greenville, South Carolina? Show of hands. Okay. Got one, okay. Maybe, I, let's see if I can turn you into absolutely wanting to come to Greenville, South Carolina. 
Obviously, only one person raised their hand out of this entire room. Um, and we get it. We are not as cool as Banff. We're not. But maybe I can convince you that we might be close. So the, the Visitors Convention Bureau hired Brains on Fire to tackle this challenge. And it was really the first time they were going to do marketing to try to get people to come to Greenville. Um, and there's a challenge with that. First, we're not on the radar, so we're not in the consideration mindset. So how many green bulls do you think there are, they are in the United States? Anybody got an idea? How many, how many green bulls in all the states? How much? Seven? How about 36? So we're the Rodney Dangerfield of names of cities. We get absolutely no respect. We really, really don't. Um, so with 36 states out of 50 having a green bull, it's really hard to get some respect. But we decided to go right at that, you know, to challenge this thing that we're not top of mind, much less of consideration. And, and so our, the, the problem with that is how do we convince people to buy, to come to Greenville to host their conferences, to come and spend a weekend, come to see a play, a show, eat at one of our wonderful restaurants, go to the mountains. We kind of live at the bottom of the Blue Ridge not nearly as beautiful as yours, but we're kind of the same type of place. So we started digging in and doing insight. We participate by having conversations with people. And we found a couple of surprises. So what we heard first was that people typically come here because they come to Greenville because they know somebody. Um, but repeat visitors kept coming back because Greenville surprised them. There was something about it that was a surprise. Number two, people kept saying that, man, the people here are really, really nice. And the third is that everybody had a that. We don't have a giant landmark. We don't have Disney World like Orlando. We just have a bunch of that's. And it was really interesting. During the interviews, people talked about that restaurant, that park, that ride on their bike. They kept mentioning all these thises and thats. And that sparked us to address this head on and rename it, yeah, we're that Greenville. We're the one out of the 36 that you should go out there and visit. And it also makes an interesting hashtag. So, so what we've learned to do this is that we started out, this is a client that, that, that we got to do a really integrated marketing mix. And sometimes when we think about that, it becomes percentages. But we looked at this a little bit differently. We looked at paid, earned, and shared, is that the mix is how they mix people into taking action. Does the advertising, does the marketing, does the social media create action and ownership? So the secret here, we believe, with this is people. So does anyone remember, uh, and I know you're not as into football as we are, Super Bowl 47 is the one that the lights went out. And so the lights went out, and our client made a small local media buy, and they ran a television commercial. And you know, maybe we're just a little naive, but everybody in Greenville thought, holy crap, we, just, we were just on national TV. They had no idea it was just run in a, in a small market. But, but it started this thing of people saying, where is that? But it ignited inside of Greenville loud and proud, passionate Greenvillians that are proud of their town. And so we started looking at finding a way to let the city be ambassadors. So I want to introduce you to Mo. She is the community manager um, for, for, this, for this project. And I want to kind of take you through what she does to have a conversation, how we got from zero to hero, which is what our client says. We believe that community is a way, not a place, to connect people. It's not your platform. It's not your technology. Community lives face to face as much as it ever does online. Um, as a brand, you don't own their social space. We've got to remember that the folks out there are human beings, and just like you, and you need to find a way as a brand to act more like a human being. So. Every voluntary re a reaction and interaction that your community makes stimulates something from your community. 
So the first thing that you know, we have to kind of focus on with our clients is that you're human, so act like one. Did you marry your spouse after one date? So it takes a few dates to start to build advocates and to connect with people. So we had to be the first members of the community. Mo went out and she photographed things to start put up on Facebook, to sh I mean on Instagram, to show people um, what we wanted them to follow and how we wanted them to act. And so by doing this, we proved ourselves. We went out there, we photographed meals, restaurants, the park, images of different things. When it snowed, we don't get it very often, but when we do, everybody goes nuts. Um, so these are images that Mo did as a community manager to start the conversation. And hashtags became really, really critical. So we started building it with these hashtags. And then the question is, will people adopt it? Will people start using it? Because we can't force them. Remember, it's their channel. It's not our channel. So we nurtured these relationships. So we found the people that started reaching out. We wanted to elevate and engage them by promoting their photographs. So the people that started taking pictures following those leads, we elevated them up to where we started sharing the images that they took. So we started doing these reposts with that hashtag, and that started building advocates, and our, the people of Greenville started to own this conversation. And what's interesting here is think about it. As a, as a mayor, we've got citizens of the town that are doing the advertising by sharing what they love that people outside of the world are seeing, and they're going to start jumping in. So the biggest thing, too, with this is letting go. So when you do that, you set the table, and then you let people own it. And so an interesting thing happened is that people started using the hashtag and creating their own thing. Ride that Greenville. Eat that Greenville. So, and these are, these are numbers there from hashtag, you see these images here and stuff. So, by letting go and letting them own, sometimes your language, amazing things can happen. So, the next step is 90% of word of mouth that leads directly to a recommendation or a purchase happens offline. And we have to remember that. So, you need to create, and a lot of the brands here do, but you need to create a way to where you get out of the way and people meet up and meet each other. So we create a thing called an Insta-Meet. We had the first one in the park. 50-something um, people showed up and they shared, uh, they took pictures, shared them on Instagram, so we instantly had an amplification. And then we moved it on to do it at one of the universities there to where it was a tour of the university in bringing these, um, these photos in. So, did this work? What happened? What's the return on that? There's been over 70,000 Instagram photos put up by people using that hashtag, yeah, that green bull. That's in about two years. We're talking that competes with Austin, Texas, some of the most cool cities in the United States. It's averaging one photo per minute. On the money side, Greenville now enjoys one of the highest occupancy rates in the United States at over 68%. And on the tourism end, Greenville, South Carolina, this small town between Atlanta and Charlotte, it, it just hit, and if I can get it to work, one billion in tourism dollars, which is unheard of. But there's a lot of magic that goes into that. Like I said, a lot of integration of marketing, but it is being driven by residents ambassadors of the city, sharing what they love, and people now use that to search to see what they're going to do when they come to Greenville. So you might say, this is all pie in the sky. I wish I had some pie in my throat. So I want to finish with a, with a story. Um, um, you asked about Love 146, and I want to introduce you to a friend of Brains on Fire, Rob Morris. And Rob came to us with a problem. He worked for a not-for-profit in New Haven, Connecticut named Justice for Children International. And he'd just been served with a cease and desist order, and he had to change his name. Um, Rob read about us. Um, he set up a meeting. They got on a plane. 
they flew to Greenville, South Carolina, I think. They didn't really have any money, but, you know, we kind of have a big heart sometimes. So he came and he said, um, I want to tell you a problem. And I don't know if you know this, but two children every minute are sold into slavery in the world. And he said, that's the problem I'm here to solve. Not to lower the statistic, but to abolish child sex slavery and exploitation. So Rob sat down and he told us a story, and I would love to tell you the story that he told us. On one of Rob's many trips to the Philippines, he had to be and pretend to be the very thing that he despised. And that was a grown man going into a brothel to choose an 8 to 12 year old young girl to have sex with. I don't know if you know much about the brothels in that part of the world, but you go into a room where there's this collective of men and there's a little tiny window. And all these men leer through that window and on the other side are all these young girls, 8 to 12 years old, with red dresses on. And each one has a number pinned to their dress. They were gathered around a television watching, of all things, cartoons. But as Rob kept looking through that window, none of the girls would make eye contact but one. And he said to himself, this girl had to be new to the brothel because she still had hope, she still had life, she still had fight in her eyes. And after we picked ourselves up, still hard to tell, to, to tell the story, we said, Rob, that's your, that's your name. It needs to be in her honor. It should be Love 146. That wasn't an easy sell because as a not-for-profit, you want a name that says what you do. And what the hell does 1146 say? That's what they said. But Rob stuck to it and convinced them. And what was interesting here, and I talked to Rob this morning, is that as an organization, sometimes you believe the fight is just yours. But it's not. You should have warriors that are fighting that injustice with you. And that's what they needed. So interesting things happen when they change their name. Um, anybody like Paramore, the band? They, on the MTV Music Awards, wore the patch on their jeans and on their guitar strap. And all of a sudden, different walks of life started owning this conversation, telling the story of this young girl. And this is an example of something they didn't think was of 16 to 18 year old young women picking up the torch for this. This is a girl that did a 146 day essay, uh, did a photograph and put it on um, Flickr. Um, people started then decorating shoes, um, getting tat his and her tattoos. He told me this morning there's over like 20 sets of these out there that they just continue to get. But I asked Rob what, what was the biggest take here by changing their brand into a story that can be passed on, is that it gives advocates, fans, ownership of this story. And, and it's, it's pretty amazing. This sleepy little brand has 49, almost 50,000 followers on Twitter. Um, this young woman, I, you know, I, it'd be wonderful if you want to follow this and do this hashtag and see this video, Remember the Girl. This video has had over 2 million views. And um, it sparked this as a lot of, as you can see, young women that have drawn Love 146 on their hands. So Rob says, and it's something we have to think about today, we think, oh my God, I've done that, so I'm going to Facebook it, I'm going to Twitter it, I'm going to do an Instagram. That is a spasm of passion. There's no wrong in doing that, but it ends with that spasm. If we really want to create change for your brand in your organization, we've got to create a collective shout. We've got to create noise. We've got to bring people together. It has to become their fight for whatever it is that you're trying to do. So back in 2004, I faced a cliff. Um, I, my, my job wasn't that inspired, inspiring. That was my fault. Um, life was pretty shitty. I was going through a divorce. And we had an interesting client. We had a client that challenged us to tackle the highest smoking rate in the United States. That was our state. And so I was facing a cliff. 
And, and the challenge to you is to jump with me. Because in one hand, we have the stuff that we do. All these things that we create, logos, symbols, marketing, social media. On the other hand, we have a human being, a living messenger that could carry your message throughout the steps of their life. I really believe that by being a good by the brand requires being good by the people. So we've got to find that good to become cultish. Because the core of the passion conversation out there is getting people to talk about them, not you. So how do we do that? How do we get them to talk about them and not you? Sparking the passion conversation within a person is what our goal should be. And they're going to care what we do. So what do you do to inspire people? That's one question. What does your brand do to inspire people? What does your organization do to inspire people? So we must invest in people so that people will invest in our brand. So um, I'll leave you with that question. You know, as much as we love the stuff that comes from our mind and our wrist, think about the people over here and what can we do to empower them to be a warrior for our brand and our organization. So we have a southern saying that I'll end with, and that is be famous for the people who love you for the way you love them. And uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.